Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Pacific Biosciences stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Pacific Biosciences is a biotechnology company that develops and manufactures systems for gene sequencing. This is also known as DNA sequencing. In 2010, the Scientist magazine named the company and their first product the top life science innovation of the year. Starting in 2011, it marketed its PacBio RS and PacBio RS2 systems to companies that required gene sequencing technology. At the time, these systems were the most advanced. Its main competitor, Illumina, developed a more efficient process. Illumina actually tried to acquire a PacB in 2018 but the FTC denied it, saying it violated antitrust laws. PAC-B did upgrade its gene sequencing machines a few times in the past several years, adding increased computer power, allowing scientists to sequence DNA quicker and cheaper. DNA sequencing is expected to be a $20 billion industry by 2025. Sequencing DNA means determining the order of the four chemical building blocks, called bases, that make up the DNA molecule. The sequence tells scientists a kind of genetic information that is carried in a particular DNA segment. DNA sequencing is used for a range of things, including diagnosis and treatment of diseases. In general, sequencing allows doctors and scientists to determine if a gene or the region that regulates a gene is linked to a disorder. Identifying the sequence of a person's DNA provides information to figure out if that person is more susceptible to certain diseases such as cancer and heart disease. With this additional information, doctors can create preventative medicine to help people possibly avoid certain diseases or if they get the disease, help them live longer, healthier lives. Also, gathering large amounts of data can help mitigate other diseases as well. You may be more familiar with DNA in saliva, fingerprints, or hair being used to catch criminals. It has not only caught criminals, but it helped free people who were wrongfully convicted of a crime. The company is headquartered in Menlo Park, California and was founded in 2004. It went public in 2010 and trades on the NASDAQ and Deutsche Börse. Let's get started with the model. This is a mid-cap company, 4.7 billion market cap. They're trading at $21 a share and they have 221 million shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future, and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. The only year they had positive free cash flow was in 2020. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that's only positive in 2020 as well. Revenue is a sales for the company, and that did peak in a trailing 12 months at 122 million. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit, and that peaked in a trailing 12 months at 54 million. Below that is their operating expenses, and these are all the expenses not directly related to generating the revenue. And below that is their operating income, which is negative every single year. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income. And the only reason it was positive in 2020 was a large gain of $134 million in other income and expenses. But I would just focus on operating income when I look at the income statement. That's a better indicator of how the company's doing. This is the company's income statement from their latest quarterly report. This is the first nine months of 2020 and the first nine months of 2021. This is the third quarter of 2020 and this is the third quarter of 2021. The top line is the revenue of the sales. Their product revenue doubled from 16 million to 31 million. Their service revenue went up from 3 million to 4 million. So their total revenue went up from 19 million to 35 million. In the trailing nine months, it went from 52 million to 94 million. Here is a breakdown of their third quarter revenue by location. 19 million of their revenue was in North America, 6.3 million in Europe, and 9.2 million in Asia. Their instrument revenue went up from 7.7 .7 million to 16 million. 
and their consumable revenue went from 8 million to 15 million. Their instrument revenue is the actual sequencing machines that they sell. They're currently selling their second version machine, their SQL 2. Compared to SQL 1, SQL 2 has better data. It's also a lot faster and it's cheaper. Illumina is their biggest competitor in this space. SQL 2 is superior to Illumina's Nanopore machine. After you buy the machine, then you have to purchase consumables. For Pack Bio's machine, it costs $3,800 to sequence a human genome. For Illumina, it costs about $5,200. And most of that cost is from consumables. If you're in the market for a DNA sequencer, you can get a used machine for $38,000. This is their SQL 1 version. Most of their consumable chips are manufactured in Taiwan. Consumables make up application accessory kits, template preparation kits, multiplexing kits, binding and cleanup kits, smart cell sequencing region kits, and accessories. In the third quarter of 2021, it sold 44 SQL 2 machines compared to 20 from last year. So the average machine cost about $360,000. The more machines it sells, the more consumables it can sell. So it can't really sell consumables unless it sells their machine. That's why their consumables revenue went up in the third quarter of 2021 versus the third quarter of 2020 because they sold more machines. And their service revenue was 4.4 million. This is from the service maintenance agreements. It charges customers for each machine it sells. The product revenue was 31 million and the cost of product revenue was 15.5 million, which are much better margins than service and other revenue because they only receive 4.4 million and it cost them 3.9 million. So they do have positive gross profit every year, but they spend a lot of money in research and development, 28 million, SGNA, 32 million, and you could probably ignore merger related expenses because that shouldn't be recurring. So every year they have an operating loss and they do have a lot of debt. So they pay 3.7 million of interest on their debt in the third quarter. They had a loss of 78 million before taxes, but they received a tax credit of 95 million. So that's why they had positive net income in the third quarter. If it was not for the tax credit, they would have had negative net income. Let's look at their statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates or loses from its operational business. So you could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is your accounting profit or loss. It's not actual cash. They leaked cash flow every year except 2020. They generated 19.5 million that year. And then you have capital expenditures, which are investments in property, plant, and equipment. They spend one to three million dollars a year in CapEx. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. Since they pretty much have negative free cash flow every year, they need money from somewhere. Since they pretty much have negative free cash flow every year, they need money from somewhere to fund their day to day operations. So they're doing it by issuing capital stock. They issued 97 million in 2018, 187 million in 2020, then 389 million in a trailing 12 months. Every time a company issues common stock, it increases the shares outstanding and makes your shares less valuable. It looks like in a trailing 12 months, they acquired some companies because their CapEx was only 3 million and their investing cash flow was over 800 million. Same thing in 2020, their investing cash flow was a big negative and they only invested 1 million in CapEx because CapEx is part of investing cash flow. Here's their operating cash flows from their latest quarterly report, the first nine months of 2020 versus the first nine months of 2021. And the way you calculate operating cash flow, you start with your net loss, then you have to add or subtract the non-cash items on the income statement, then adjust for changes in working capital. We start with the negative 112 million then we have to add back a $52 million loss. We have to add back $5 million of depreciation. We have to add back all the amortization and stock-based compensation. Remember, they reported a tax credit. That improved their net income, but we have to minus that out here on the cash flow from operations section because they didn't actually receive $95 million from the government. Some people may think that's what a tax credit is. A tax credit is just a dollar amount you can use in the future to offset your future income. So you pay less taxes. A tax credit is a dollar amount you can use to reduce your future taxable income, which will help you pay less taxes. Because if you made $50,000 on your job and you pay taxes on that $50,000, 
say you pay $10,000 in taxes, if you had a tax credit for $40,000, then your taxable income would be down to $10,000 and you would pay taxes on that $10,000. So you may only pay $2,000 in taxes. Deferred income taxes are taxes a company will eventually pay or receive, but is not due yet. It's because of the difference the way the IRS and GAAP accounts for taxes. They had a cash outflow of seven million from accounts receivables, a cash outflow of five and a half million from inventory, a cash inflow of 10 million from accrued expenses, a cash inflow of 18 million from deferred revenue. They reported an accounting loss of 112 million, but they actually lost 79 million of cash flow. Last year, it was an accounting loss of 45 million, but they generated 34 million of cash flow only because they received $98 million here. This is a one-time item. You can't expect to receive this in the future. Illumina tried to acquire this company, but the deal was quashed due to antitrust violations. If the merger does not go through, then according to the agreement, Illumina would have to pay this company $98 million. That's where the $98 million comes from, the termination fee. Here's their investing and financing section. On the top of the investing section is investments in property and equipment. That was three million, last year was one million. When companies issue stock and bring in lots of cash, they usually invest that cash in short-term investments so they could earn a little interest. So they invested 857 million in short-term investments. So it looks like they needed some cash, 212 million, so they sold some of those investments. Some of those short-term investments matured, that was 223 million. They acquired two companies, Circulomics and Omniome for $29 million and $291 million. They had a cash outflow of $744 million in their investing section. Last year it was $121 million. Circulomics is a leader in high molecular weight DNA extraction. Omniome is a much bigger acquisition. They're developing a highly differentiated proprietary short read DNA sequencing platform. These two acquisitions should really help the company move its technology forward. Omniome has 120 employees and over 60 patents. Before the Illumina deal was terminated, they were receiving money from Illumina so PacB can continue its R&D process. They call this continuation advances. Last year they received 34 million. This was a loan by Illumina. It wasn't free money, but it was interest free. In the first nine months of 2021, they paid back 52 million on that loan. This year, they raised 900 million by issuing convertible debt. That's debt that can be converted to equity if the stock price hits a certain number. And they raised 300 million from an equity offering. Plus, they raised $30 million from their employees. So in the financing section, they raised 1.2 billion. Last year was 126 million. This is the equity section on their 930 balance sheet. They raised 2 billion from selling their business and they lost 1.1 billion from running their business. Let's look at the capital structure. They have 841 million of equity, 950 million of debt. They have 47% equity, 53% debt. And they could pay off all the debt with the cash on their balance sheet and still have 127 million of cash left over. And I gave them the lowest whack on Finbox, 7.8%, and that's the discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated seven years of future free cash flows. We also estimated the terminal value, which is all cash flows past year seven at 3.2 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today's and weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $2.3 billion. We divide that by 221 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $10. They're trading at $21. So they're trading at a 106% premium. It's a sell according to the model. I did this ticker back in June while they were trading at $29 a share and my valuation was 25. So their current price of 21 did fall below my $25 target. Their annual revenue is projected to grow 32.4%. So I grew their revenue 32.4% for the next seven years. That's how I got their future revenue estimates. To get their future free cash flows, I need to see what percent of their revenue they convert to free cash flow. Since they only had positive free cash flow one year, I took 2020. 18 divided by 79 is 23%. So I assume they would convert 23% of their revenue to free cash flow. So I multiplied these revenue numbers by 23%. That's how I got their future free cash flows. So it is really hard to value this company. It can really go in a lot of directions. If their sequencing machines are really successful, then of course the stock could go much, much higher. 
but it's really hard to tell how well they're going to do and how much of the market they're going to have. If they do make it big, you want to buy the stock now. You don't want to wait till they become big because by that point, the stock price will be too high. Two analysts priced this stock and the price targets were $32 and $45. This is where the stock has been trading the last two years. So you can see it was really low in 2020 and then it shot way up past $50 a share. But it's down more than 50% since that point. So you can see the stock is all over the place. So people are investing in this stock on the future because at this point they really haven't brought in much revenue. So their technology is very valuable, but of course you have to worry about competition. There's companies like Illumina and if they come out with a better machine that's cheaper and faster and more efficient, then there's going to be a lot less interest in this company's product. The fact that they do have sales and it does seem like the sales are increasing is a good sign. The lines down here are the trading activity. And look how big these lines got back in the beginning of the year. Lots of trading activity. When there's a green line, that means the buy orders are higher than the sell orders and the stock price goes up. When there's a red line, that means the sell orders are higher than the buy orders and the stock price goes down. They have a beta of 1.16, so the stock is not too volatile. It moves a little more than a market. It's gone down 22% in the past 52 weeks while the S&P is up 27%. The 52 week low is 18, the high is 54 and the stock is trading below its 50 day and 200 day moving average. About 3 million shares are traded each day on this stock. Of the 221 million shares outstanding, 218 million are on float, 84% are held by institutions. Almost 10% of the shares on float are shorted. Their employee count hasn't moved too much in the past several years. They currently employ 412 people. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you would have over $80,000 today. That's a 23% annual return. In the past 12 months, no insiders have bought the stock, only sells. 20,000 shares have been sold within three months, 90,000 in three to six months, and 190,000 in nine to 12 months. Here's a breakdown of the people who sold their stock, the date, how many shares, and the price they sold them at. So this person who sold 101,000 shares at $50, that was a really smart move. If they want, they can buy the shares back today at less than half the price. Institutions own 84% of the stock and the general public 15%. ARK Investment, the fund Kathy Wood runs, owns 10% of the stock. 23 million shares valued at close to half a billion dollars. The next biggest shareholder is Vanguard, BlackRock, Capital Research, and Jackson Square Partners. Let's look at their financial ratios. We can't look at the PE since they have negative net income. They have a pretty high price of sales of 39, much worse than the market median and average. Their price to book is pretty good at 5.6, that's between the market median and average. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. And the way you calculate book value per share is equity over shares outstanding. They have 841 million of equity. Equity is assets minus liabilities, but only 18 million of tangible equity since they have a lot of intangible assets on their balance sheet from all the acquisitions. Here's a list of their non-current assets. 31 million of prop, three, two, one. Here's a list of their non-current assets. 31 million of property and equipment. This is net of depreciation. 46 million of operating lease right of use assets. These are assets they lease from other companies using an operating lease. An operating lease is when you lease an asset, but you give back the asset at the end of the term. A financing lease is when you lease an asset, but retain the asset at the end of the lease term. 4.6 million of long-term restricted cash, over 800 million of intangible assets. They have a really high current ratio and quick ratio above 20. Here's a list of their current assets, 425 million of cash, 654 million of short-term investments. And the way I know their short-term investments is because they're in the current assets section. Anything listed in current assets are assets that will be converted to cash within 12 months. 24 million of accounts receivables. This is money other companies owe them. 18 million of inventory and 7.2 million of prepaid expenses. A prepaid expense is when PACB makes an advance payment for a good or service to be received in the future. Initially, it's recorded as an asset. 
Initially, it's recorded as an asset on the balance sheet, but it's expensed over time onto the income statement. Let's look at their current liabilities. They have 5 million of accounts payable. This is how much they owe other companies. 31 million of accrued expenses. 10 million of deferred revenue. This means Pack B received $10 million for product or service. It's going to send a customer in the future. 7 million of operating lease liabilities and 2.9 million of other. They had negative 97 million of free cash flow in the trailing 12 months, but over 1 billion of working capital. Working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. So they're well funded. They should have enough money to get through the next few years without doing another capital raise. The best way to look at ratios is to compare them to companies in the same industry. I've done videos of six companies in the same industry as Pack B. And if Pack B has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. So they're worse in PE since they have negative net income. The average price of sales is pretty poor in this industry, but they're worse than the average. They're average in price to book. They have a really high current ratio. They have a negative ROE like most companies in this industry. Only Illumina has a positive ROE. And they're a little worse than average in debt. And they're a pretty small company, a lot smaller than the average. But these are only the companies I've done a video on. There's a lot more companies in their industry. I found 86 tickers of companies in the same industry as Pack B, and the average market cap for all those companies is 12.8 billion. They have the 26th highest market cap. The average price of sales is really high because a couple of companies have a price of sales in the thousands. And the average revenue is 2.2 billion. They're really tiny at 122 million. There's two companies in this industry that are bigger than Illumina. They're both over 200 billion market cap, so massive companies. And both of them have a better price of sales than Illumina. To summarize, I have them trading at a 106% premium. But like I said earlier, it's really hard to value this company using a discounted cash flow model. There's so much unknowns about the future. You could probably make a lot of money swing trading this stock because a lot of big investors are buying this stock. So when big investors buy the stock, like institutions or people like Kathy Wood, then a lot of other people jump on. But it has come down a lot the past several months. There's been a lot of insider selling. So it could be a good opportunity to pick it up at a cheap price. But of course, it could come down a lot more. It could come down to $10. Nobody really knows. But if you're in it for the long haul, then it's a great time to buy it now. I rank their free cash flows 1 out of 10, their revenue 4 out of 10, and their ratios 2 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.